the, the biggest pain points for the finance industry these days is the cost of compliance. For smaller firms or mid-sized firms, it's, it's, it's costing so much money that COVID did and uh, Russia starts to pay difficult, uh, you know, energy crisis, inflation. So, so we're trying to make that cost of compliance significantly lower than it used to be. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello everyone, this is Jackie DeMink together with Wouter Del Valle and welcome to the Mangtas Nation podcast. In today's episode, we roll out our red carpet and bring out some beers for a very special Belgian guest. He saw a gap in the finance industry and set to fill it out with his company, Elysian NXT. He's revolutionizing the way financial institutions manage risk and comply with regulations, making it more efficient and cost-effective. With his leadership and expertise, he is paving the way in the fintech industry and shaping the future of finance. Listeners, it's time to get some deeper insights from the CEO and founder of Elysian NXT, Chris Pepe. Wow, Chris, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks for the great introduction. <laughs> Well, we're definitely thrilled to have you here today to share your insights and expertise with our listeners. But before we dive into the conversation, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background, Chris? Uh, sure. As, as you said, I'm, I'm originally from Belgium, uh, but I'm, I'm currently, my home is uh, Bangkok, Thailand. So uh, I'm... Uh, I say an old guy in an industry, uh, so uh, started uh, my first company when I was 30, started my second company was when I was 50, so these are quite pivotal years in a, a man's life. Uh, so uh, background, educationally, I've got a master in um, uh, economics and one in, in IT, started my career in finance, uh, Princeton Young Auditor several years, then uh, switched to IT site on the vendor uh, space for working for Dun & Bradstreet Software. Uh, you have to remember these were the good old mainframe days, so uh, nothing what you see uh, these days. I started working for a small uh, Belgian company at that time, uh, which was FICS. I was sent to London for three years working for an investment bank uh, as a consultant on a project which was basically building an enterprise-wide uh, sub-budget for financial controllers. So working in that kind of um, uh, high speed, a lot of pressure environment, also first time working abroad, uh, changed basically uh, you know, or shaped my, my, my further career. Took me out of my comfort zone, so after done three years together with uh, Dirk who was also working on the same project. We kind of uh, started our first company together. Tell us a bit more uh, about this company, Chris, and and why you actually decided to, to get start. out of your comfort zone. Yeah, even further, right, from Belgium to the UK, but then say, hey, now now we take the bigger leap. Let's do a company. Um, well. We saw that what we were building uh, was kind of a, a great, um, unique set of data which was used by uh, financial controls to do different things for REC reporting purposes, for finance, uh, for risk. We tried, uh, so Derek and myself, we tried to sell it uh, in-house uh, to the company to say that this is, it's a great idea that let's build a, a product uh, out of it. Uh, but um, the company at the time was not interested to go into that direction. So, uh, so we sat together and said, why are we not trying to do it ourselves? Uh, you know, uh, we think that idea has, has great potential um, and uh, let's give it a shot. Uh, you have to remember that at the time, we're talking about shortly before the year 2000, so a lot of, of financial institutions were replacing their core banking application. 
So there was an appetite for these kind of uh, products where you have all your data sitting in one place to do a variety of, of things. So we were lucky that after a couple of months, uh, one of the, the banks uh, saw that, uh, yeah, that that's what, what they need and uh, we had our first client. Uh, so sometimes you need a combination of maybe naivety and uh, of being naive and, and, and having a lot, of, uh, a lot of luck sometimes. And, and uh, that and was the start of a crazy journey, uh, you know, um, starting from, you know, uh, an office where the two of us uh, sat together face to face, uh, you know, growing the company to about 300 people uh, with worldwide presence uh, in, 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 in the States, in Asia, you know, uh, name it, uh, with, with some of the, the bigger uh, banks as customer, Bank of New York. Uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, so it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a fascinating journey. And what's great about it is that because um, we hired quite some uh, young talent in Belgium, uh, uh, and 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 they were sent abroad uh, very very fast, I must say, um, and. A lot of these uh, that young talent they become they became entrepreneurs on their own, uh, you know. As, as as you know, after like 15 years, you see a lot of spin-offs uh, of, of of what used to be French architects, uh, you know, Singapore, Australia, you know, the the Baltics, uh, name it. it it's uh, it's it's very nice to see that 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 you know that young talent, uh, you know. I found the, 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 this entrepreneurial spirit and, and they say, oh, okay, fine, we, we, we're going to try it ourselves as well. And that, that's, that's, that's great to see. I love that. There are a lot of influencers today, but back in the day, Chris was the influencer in a way. Well, because he didn't. I would say the influencer, but it's, it's like uh, these young guys, they grab the opportunity and, you know, it, it was really, you, you're being sent to the other side of the planet and, you know, you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they thrived on that. And, and for some reason, there was a lot of, you know, great talent in that company that we hired, you know, and it's, uh, Again, it's, it's lovely to see all these uh, these, these uh, entrepreneurial spin-offs from, from the, the original flagship. And, and was that part of your core strategy going in? Did you know that that was going to be a big part of your growth strategy to get these young kids and, and basically, you know, send them on a journey? Well, we didn't do a lot of strategy, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it was this kind of, I would say... Uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's a it's a big difference, as as you know, working for a big company or working for a, for a startup. Uh, you, big company, you've got your strategy, uh, you know, all written down. Your career plan is there uh, with with uh, these kind of entrepreneurial, these kind of startups. They throw you in the deep end, and you have to be able to swim. And and uh, you know, when I uh, hired people, I always said, look do realize that that there's a massive difference between being you know working for for, for a big organization or working for you know a, a small company you can learn a lot but you have to have the right mindset for it you know and if you and, and you love if you have that that spirit that mindset then you can learn so much you know uh, you can learn you know in one year is, is equivalent to many years in a big organization and, and not only did you manage to start something from nothing, right? You did it with, with a friend, as you mentioned. Correct. Right. Uh, you made it big, you went global, successful, profitable, all of that. What many entrepreneurs also strive for is an exit. So you said you're, you have two, so you managed an exit as well, Chris. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, and, and I would say this is one very important. Uh, lesson I always give to, to people who are in the startup uh, business to say, look, work on, on your on, on on your cash, you know. And um, lucky enough, you know, the world is very different now than it was uh, around the year 2000. There's, there's a lot of cash available. There's a lot of, there's a lot of venture capitalists. But also, say, do realize, you know, once you have a VC on board, there is an exit strategy. 
know, even if it's a small percentage or a small participation that they have in the company, it is an exit strategy. You know, these guys want to get out in five years' time. Uh, so it's it's kind of a you know, I, I I do remember that that when we had our first VC on board, that Dirk came to see me and said, Chris, this is fundamentally going to be a you know a different game from now on, because there's now external capital on board. These guys they they, they have a clear exit strategy in their mind, and uh, you know uh, you you do have to realize it when you start up a company. Now. It's a very important choice. Uh, do I grow organically or uh, do I do it with, with the help of external capital? When it and comes how did that feel? Sorry, <laughs> how did that feel like to exit? Like um, your baby all of a sudden? Uh, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's always. Well, I must say it's, it was a, a tough moment uh, because I, I do realize that uh, I was sitting in, 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 in the Bangkok office and I said this is, you know, this is the best time of my life, it will never be so much fun anymore, you know. Uh, so, so selling it was, was quite a painful decision but with all respect to, to, to Dirk and the VCs on board, um, they, the VCs had a long term strategy, they support us all all the way, so you know, uh, I fully respect their decision to say, okay, at a certain moment in time, when the price is right for all parties and the the the, 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 the part who's taking over the baby, that you see, okay, there's a strategy behind it, uh, and you can live with that. Then it's the right moment in time. And then, so this is you were 30. You started this. You exited. And then you started on a second entrepreneurial baby. You had a bug again. Oh. You you got tired of corporate. What was the thinking? I I stayed uh, with 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 uh, WK who took over uh, financial architects for uh, for five years uh, with with full intention because uh, you know I, I I liked what they were doing uh, with the company. I liked the, the strategy. Uh, but you know after a while after five years and, and there was a new thing coming on the market which was called IFRS 9, it's basically calculating the expected credit losses for institutions and that's a very fundamental change uh, in, in, in the risk space that we are in because for the first time uh, you know, banks need to take into consideration the future you know and unless you have a, a, a one of these glazed and balls that you can see the future uh, unless you have one of these, you know, you have to be very flexible, very fast, because you know we live in a very uncertain world. So um, it requires lots of calculations, lots of modeling. So we realized with, with, with the technology that we had at that time, which was batch driven, I said this is impossible to, to do it in a timely fashion or to be able to, to, to run simulations. So uh, we sat down with, with a couple of people uh, of of, the, of, of of the old uh, Finar gang to say, okay, they felt the same kind of frustration from a product point of view to say, look, we need to do s something because, you know, it's um, it's not nice having to sell a product that you know, you know, it's it's going to be difficult to meet what the banks really need with, uh, you know, the kind of uh, time simulations pressure that, that's on them. So and that was the reason why we, at a certain point in time, we decided we're going to start uh, a new company, uh, which was, you know, Elysian NXT, based around the idea let's use, uh, you know, streaming technology uh, to be able to do calculations uh, in, in, in uh, real time on millions and millions of, of contracts, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, calculation data points, uh, and it basically enables know the banks and, and financial institutions to run as many simulation stress tests as they want which is a radical difference with uh, the traditional vendors in the space the Moody's the Oracle's the WK's who still are very much batch uh, oriented it and you and know you can play with modern technology like uh, cloud technology uh, or containerization uh, you know uh, 
But you know, if you put your application, which is batch driven, in a container and you made it available in the web, that doesn't solve the real underlying problem. No? Uh, sometimes technology is misused, you're throwing in some buzzwords, mm -hmm. but you basically have to fundamentally redesign the entire architecture to make really optimal use of uh, cloud technology, of um, you know, orchestration, uh, streaming technology. Uh, otherwise, it's just a patchwork. And I would say, because you're primarily focused on banks, is that correct, Chris? Uh, yeah, financial institutions, yeah. In yeah including, in okay, well. non-banks. Yeah, financial okay. firms, yeah. Financial institutions um, are probably the last types of organizations to, to move <laughs> when new technology comes, like when it comes to cloud, many, many solutions were deployed decade, a decade ahead before banks were on it, right? Um, now, having said that, there are also a lot of fintechs, but that's quite different because you're talking more back-end and middle-end uh, solutions. Um, yeah. How do you see, like, and now I guess with COVID as well, correct me if I'm wrong, the whole mindset of going on site and doing stuff uh, also has to change. So, so almost cloud is almost necessary, has probably fast-tracked it. So has, is that correct? Has COVID actually fast-tracked the adoption of cloud-based solutions by banks? And, and other yeah, financial without, solutions? Without, without any doubt. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, before COVID, uh, when you went into a, a, a bank, uh, you know, you discussed like uh, having to do a project. I mean, all people had to work physically on site, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, thanks to COVID, uh, I mean, the whole mind shift is gone because you no, know, they say we're not on site ourselves, so we don't want you guys to come here. You know, you can uh, work remotely. You know, we have the the, the cloud technology. Uh, so when we compare, you know, COVID, uh, post COVID, then probably 90% of the implementation we do is, is pure software as a service. Yeah, and, and certainly in, in Australia and Europe, uh, that, that's, that's a common thing. I mean, Asia does have to catch up a bit. Um, mm. uh, we had our first client uh, last year with one of the digital players in Indonesia. Uh, but the majority here in Southeast Asia is, is still, you know, non-cloud based. And for do you whatever, see that change? For, for, whatever, for whatever reason. Do you, but that will change in your opinion? I, 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 maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, I think one of the, the, the reasons that a lot of you know, uh, banks here in the region are not still cloud-based is that because also IT wants to keep the buying power of all the, the equipment. Yeah, so it also needs a mind shift on an organizational level to say, look, uh, you know, you have to give up that that uh, authority, that power, because once they go into software as a service, you know, uh, you don't have to buy those uh, those big machines anymore. So it will come because you know, uh, there's no reason not anymore uh, because legislation is also saying, okay, the data cannot leave the country. But if you look at, for example, AWS, they are in Indonesia, you know, they are in uh, Singapore, they are in, uh, in Thailand. So the data doesn't have to leave the, the data centers which are located in the country. Okay, nice. But then now talking about, about this and you starting your, your second company, Chris, tell us a little bit more about Elysium. Elysian sure. NXT. Sure. So Elysian NXT uh, is is uh, focused on bringing the world of, of real time in the space of uh, uh, risk uh, platforms for the financial industries. So we have to think about mm -hmm. IFRS nine. Have to think about Basel. So credit risk, interest rate risk, liquid risk, or all the risk that banks have. And because of the the real time speed, because of the uh, flexibility. It enables the banks not only to report on time to the regulator, but also to do uh, lots of simulations and stress tests for uh, their internal management purposes. 
So that, that's the focus uh, of, of, of uh, Legion NXT. That's the risk platform that we have. We are now around 40 institutions across the world using uh, our risk uh, platform. Um, uh, so the development center is based here in, in, in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we have offices in uh, Jakarta and in Brussels. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the goal of the company. Is we want to, with that technology, that there's so many, many nice things you can do. You know, uh, one of the things is that it reduces significantly the cost of compliance. And if you talk about the, the financial industry, one of the, the biggest pain points for the financial industry these days is the cost of compliance. Right. Certainly mm -hmm. for, for smaller firms or mid-sized firms, it's, it's, it's costing so much money. And, you know, the last 10 years they have worked in a, in a low interest rate uh, environment. So uh, the, the, the profit margins were small and you're being confronted with a lot of um, regulatory demands mm -hmm. as an offset of the uh, great financial crisis in 2008. Mm -hmm. Think about IFRS 9, think about the whole fundamental review of the trading book for your market risk, uh, think about the changes uh, in, in Basel credit risk. And this in, in an environment which is crazy turbulent. You know, uh, you had the COVID and uh, Russia starts to play difficult, uh, you know, energy crisis, inflation. Uh, so regulators are, are saying you have to do simulations. We need to see, you know, with all this happening, you know, worst case scenario where, you know, do we have enough provisions? Do we have enough capital? Uh, so, so we're trying to make that cost of compliance significantly lower than it used to be. Cloud plays there in a role because with, with, if you have the proper technology, you have, you know, your architecture is microservice based and, and you know, it, it can work nicely in the cloud and you can, you know, um, tune up and down on demand when it's really needed instead of buying the biggest machine on the planet in case that there's a pain point in performance. Again, uh, our philosophy is zero foot footprint at our clients. So we don't allow consultants to do any customizations on site. If banks need a specific uh, PD or LHD model, we're going to build it for them and integrate it in our platform. And this is incredible when you think about, you know, being able to go in a matter of, of, of hours or days into the next, next release, the next version. Because regulation is, is, is changing all the time. Yeah, so if you're stuck mm -hmm. with version because, you know, you had so much customization going on on site and it makes it almost impossible to migrate, then you're stuck. That version becomes stale very, very fast. Yeah. So in, in that um, environment, what we're trying to do is to say, look, we make sure you stay compliant because we have a zero footprint at the client site. So you can upgrade in a matter of, of, uh, of days. Uh, and I guess even beyond, uh, I, even if there was no footprint, right? The fact that it's SaaS based means that upgrades are part of it. Uh, I'm presuming, like that, an upgrade in itself is going to be extremely we, we taken are, care yeah. of. So, so that's I mean, an upgrade can take a year. Correct. Exactly. So yeah. something that can normally take a year for some technical upgrade is now done instantly for them without anything to worry about, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, that, that's the upgrade component. Then you have the SaaS component of well, as well. But you also mentioned something interesting. Productizing some of these upgrades means you have economies of scale, I presume. So you build it once, you deploy it, you can spread the cost very cost effectively across the, the clients profit. Right, and that's Not that's correct. kind of groundbreaking, I guess, for many different compared to other solutions. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, no, that's correct. That's also one of the reasons why we don't go into the compliance reports themselves, uh, because then you're stuck to a certain country, which you have to maintain, and in the end, all the efforts are going in and uh, you know making sure the reports are still up to date. We said, okay, we want to focus on global regulatory risk trends. So that you solve the issue once, then you can, you know, it's available for everybody. And it's really productized. So beyond SaaS, Chris, beyond SaaS as a, as a solution uh, and an upgrade to the banking industry or the finance industry in general, is there something else that you're 
predicting beyond that? Like, is there an AI component or, or a blockchain? Or are there certain components, like te- knowing that where the tech is heading now, right? And some industries are adopting. Do you see some other aspects coming your way beyond SaaS? That you're well, certainly at? in the space of the, the modeling, the advanced modeling space. So we see more and more institutions using AI technology, certainly when they do modeling for their retail portfolios. Yeah. So uh, that, that that's you know a component which uh, which could become very important in the future. Uh, also, what we're trying to do is to put intelligence in the data analysis and the big data analysis to say let's see if you know if there are outliers in there that need special attention. Uh, so you're trying to build intelligence within the whole space of data analytics. Uh, but also as an input site in, in uh, you know what's going into the, the advanced models and that becomes more and more important and there's also a lot of ethical <laughs> questions being raised around the use of, of AI in, in the whole modeling space uh, for, for, uh, for uh, the, the, the portfolios and it's very important that, that people understand what that logic still is uh, and that people can explain what ultimately drives a uh, go or not non-go uh, when, when someone knocks on the door to ask for a loan. And I guess explainability is one thing, but you mentioned something interesting, uh, ethics. Could you give an example um, of where you would apply ethics uh, to, this, to, to the modeling? Uh, it is... Um, it's a, it's a touchy subject uh, to say fine, you know, um, and, and certainly in the, in the space of uh, uh, you know credit risk retail portfolios in terms of you know background of people, educational settings, uh, race, uh, religion, uh, all the parameters that go ultimately in the model, and someone needs to supervise it that you know um, that uh, that AI thing is not. Going too uh, too crazy. Yeah. Overgeneralize based on past data. Overgeneralizing. Yeah. Overgeneralizing. <laughs> like this religion is impacting, so let's make some. Ah, okay, interesting. Which um, is a very uh, topic for the moment. Huh? Oh yeah. And and now, Chris, so also the whole, well, one of the fascinating areas is the whole ESG. You know, uh, you know, especially around climate risk, um, that uh, the regulators are asking the banks to do their uh, homework to say, look, fine, we want to see, uh, you know, uh, banks are often used to do the homework for the, the political decision makers, you know, in terms of gathering data, in terms of analyzing the data, in terms of, you know, the green certificates that, uh, you know, relate to, uh, to houses or to, uh, to companies have specific ratings. Again, that, that will increase a lot the, 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 that compliance cost again. Because certainly in Europe, banks are being pushed to do stress tests in terms of what that transition will cost them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, examples would be to say, for example, in the, in the credit risk space is, you know, collateral, where is it located? Is it somewhere located in, you know, uh, an area which is prone to flooding? Uh, um, uh, what about, you know, a green certificate for a certain collateral increases massively the value of a certain collateral. Uh, so all these things now need to be gathered on the most granular level. So it's a massive exercise. Because also imagine, you know, the, the, when they ask you to calculate the potential risk over, you know, 10, 15 years, the kind of simulations which are needed. Worst case scenario, you know, uh, orderly transition, these kind of scenarios, it's, 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 it's quite some, uh, some uh, interesting uh, cases there. It sounds like it's going to be good for the world in general. Anyway, if if the value of a collateral like... goes up by a green certificate, as long as it's not too greenwashy, uh, <laughs> and the banks do their job really well, and you build yeah. the right tech, Chris, it sounds like ultimately it will enforce the right behavior. 
No, true, true, and that's that's also you know what the political decision makers are forcing to that you know when you're gonna have um, a corporate in a certain sector which is not that green, you know their operation costs become much higher, and and you. Tr the decision maker will try banks also to help in that transition to a greener economy. Like it more expensive for either people or for corporates uh, who are not following that transition. So it's ultimately a very good case. Well, and these are things that are definitely, obviously not easy to do, Chris. But what in your, in your companies, what in in starting it and, and in running it excites you. Like you you can imagine after a successful startup, you can just say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna retire now, I'm gonna go on an early early pension, not worry about anything. But then you start another company. And so what what drives you? Well, I tried retirement for six months in Bangkok, but uh, I said that I have to go back to work, otherwise I'm not going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the, the joy of, of you know, being able to, to work in a team uh, on, on, with new technology, uh, you know, addressing some of the, 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 the key areas of, of making cost for compliance uh, much lower than before. I mean, it's fascinating, you know. Uh, I do love to work in this industry. I love to work with with uh, you know very um, good people that we have in the team. Uh, so it's it's yeah. I have no uh, plans to retire again. <laughs> Maybe even start a third company in the future. <laughs> no, no. Uh, for me, that, that that's uh, that's it. I mean, I'm also we don't have the pressure of, of external capital because we're, we're self-funded. Mm -hmm. uh, part to, of course, the success of, of the first company. Uh, so that gives a certain freedom to say, you know, we, we just have to focus on the product, uh, you know, the references, you know, uh, doing the right things. Uh, so no, uh, this is it, exactly, this is it. <laughs> and if you could do something different in your first company with everything that you, you've learned from it and starting your, your next company now, what would you, would you have done anything differently? It's a good question. Um, I, I honestly don't think so. I honestly don't think so. We had a great journey for 15 years. Uh, you know, a very successful exit. Uh, a lot of you know entrepreneurial spin-offs uh, from 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 that part. Um, I moved to this area, which I, I love, this part of the of, of the world. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to say, okay, we could start again, uh, you know, in this, this adventure uh, with a lot of people from the first gang. Um, and, you know, some people tell me, okay, Chris, you've done it before, so you know what to do. It must be much easier, but uh, forget it. It's, it's not true, you know. Uh, you know how painful it is and you know the kind of key steps that you need to have the first five years. First five years is are the most difficult ones for every startup. Uh, it's about getting uh, the right people on board. Of course, when you do it the second time, you have a lot of people that you know and you, know, you bring bring with you, so that that's easier. But the rest is, you know, you have to have a product which is not marginally better, but is far superior than your than the existing place. Because otherwise, forget it. No, no financial institution will buy something marginally better. They're not going to risk that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, building up references in this space is, is difficult. You know, uh, you go to a bank, uh, you're in the selection, they ask you, okay, can you give me the three years financial statements? Hello, we start up. Yeah. Uh, so you really, and we were very lucky that uh, very early, uh, you know, what, the biggest bank in Indonesia, you know, realized that that platform could do what they wanted to do. They only had a window of, of you know three four hours to run their calculations, and uh, you know they tested the platform and said yeah this this has the you know the capacity to do it. Uh, so we were very lucky that that you know uh, because often you're confronted with you know pages and pages of RFIs RFPs. They ask for features, 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 features. Instead of looking you know what's you know 
what's the underneath the platform you know what does it do different you know and and you know we always try to convince um, people that we talk to, to say look don't believe a word a word what we're saying I, mean, I know it sounds much too good uh, because also the, the industry has a very bad reputation you know, uh, uh, you know, over promising and under delivering. Uh, so I said, look, don't believe a word what I'm saying. Just, you know, test the product out free of charge and see what it does, see what it can do, the capacity of, of, of what's possible. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, once people have tested it, they say, okay, it is true. It, it is, you know, drastically different than existing players. So, Another part of the of in the startup scene is is make sure you keep your eye constant on the runway. You know the number of months you can survive with your existing cash. Because I see a lot of startups who are uh, too optimistic. You know, uh, and certainly when you're building a product, it takes a long time before the first revenues are coming in. So we have to make sure that you survive that period. So team, product references, cash. That's what it's all about. And is there something you took from startup one, business one, besides people, okay, <laughs> that you then brought to, to two, where you say, I learned so much, and this is going to fast track and, and really turbo boost the way I'm going to execute on business two. Um, like, I mean, 15 years of entrepreneurial experience must have brought quite a bit of something for your second no, business. The, the first thing that we do, that, that we do, we, we sat together and say, okay, what are the lessons learned? You know, what should we be able to do better? Yeah. That was the first thing we did. So instead of like, rules engine, yes, no. Yeah. Uh, implementation times. Um, and all the things that we've, we've, we've done in the first, like a rules engine is a great example. You know, when we were at Finnup, we had a great rules engine. Uh, so typically an implementation uh, was sending an army of consultants who kind of used the rules engine to do exactly what the client wanted. Yeah, uh, which as such, nothing, nothing bad about it, but it comes with certain consequences. And one of them is that you leave a very big footprint at the client so there's a lot of customization that has done and not a lot of all these goodies are flowing back into the products so that was one of a, a very key important lesson and that's basically nothing to do with technology but more kind of an approach to say look we're not going to hit that path and that has painful financial consequences because you lose that that beautiful uh, you know consulting revenue you know, uh, certainly in the first couple of years, because you have to build everything within the product, free of charge. But ultimately, I mean, the the, the advantage is 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 huge, no? And and you continuous continuously as such also enriching the product. You know, when we're now in the space of iPhone nine, it's it's frankly impossible to lose an iPhone nine opportunity because you know we've done maybe. 30 implementation on iPhone 9, it's all within the product, so we have all these, you know, the models that they can choose from. It's crazy. So it's indeed, it's you sit down, okay, rules engine, speed of implementation, you know, uh, performance, data duplication, all these kind of stuff that you say, we're going to try to do it drastically different. Because if you don't do that, you're going to make the same mistakes all over again. <laughs> uh, it's, it sounds like a very deep understanding of the domain and the systems and the approaches that you build up <laughs> as you go and assess, you build your business and, and compare yourself and now you have a blank slate and you can start again. Well, that also, seems to be I'm like not, almost... I'm not, I'm not Elon Musk who is good in so many things, I'm only good in one thing, so yeah, this is <laughs> the risk domain. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, you can try to get out of your comfort zone again, Chris. And <laughs> <laughs> you went from Belgium to London after all, Chris. That's a, <laughs> true, 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 that's, true, that's a jump. <laughs> but it's also because you know, a, a you're in Bangkok. It's also a lesson learned is to stay focused, huh? because you get 
lot of questions from from uh, from your clients to say why don't you do this for us? And then you have to have discipline to say no because we want to be the best company in in these specific you know risk management solutions. Yeah, you you have to sometimes often say no because it's important as as a player to say okay this is our domain this is what we're super good at. Do you find that refreshing to be able to say no? Um, it's painful, but you have to. Uh, <laughs> uh. No, I think that right. I, 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 I did it a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> no. Let's say more than once in the last uh, 12 months. And I find it very, very refreshing um, no, to be able to do it. It's painful, but but in the bigger yeah. scheme of things, it shows that you're focused. Yeah, indeed. I, uh, indeed. I like it. Indeed. indeed. I think our clients like that as well from us to say, okay, you know, these guys every year, they bring up a new new version. It's always improving what they're doing. You know, it's enriching. It's, uh, you know, we're not doing thousand and one for, uh, different things. We will stick to what we're good at. And you work mostly with uh, big banks, Chris, or you also work with uh, smaller banks? It's a very good question. You know, uh, with our first company, because of, of the way the solution was built, the way the solution was implemented, you could only target mid-size and big banks. You know, when we have this, everything is coming out of the box approach, we have very small clients as well. We can implement, uh, we did an implementation in Australia for one of the, 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 the smaller uh, mutual funds in, in, in four weeks, a Basel implementation, Credit RWA. Mm -hmm. uh, it runs in SaaS, so it's, uh, we, our pricing is on the volumes that our clients have. So if you come with 5,000 contracts, you pay this price, if you come with 10 million contracts, it's a different ballgame. And, and it's, it's very refreshing also to work with, with uh, not only with the big boys, but also with you know with, with uh, digital banks, startup banks, uh, smaller banks. It's 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 nice. It's refreshing. So so beyond beyond, you know, doing this with a team, conquering the world, you know, um, having fun, you know, operating in the space you uh, you you're you're really good at. What's the vision, Chris? What's the end game? The end game is the number one player globally in the risk management platforms. We want to conquer the world. Boom. And uh, for businesses interested in connecting with you, Chris, where can they find you or how can they best get in touch with you? Uh, very easy to uh, look for my name in, in, uh, in LinkedIn. I have a very unique uh, surname. Uh, Pupe, P-U-I-P-E, so very easy to find me back or just on the website www.leasingnxt.com. Uh, uh. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, Chris, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Your thank insights. You yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Your insights have been definitely been uh, incredible and valuable and we think that all the work that you do in the fintech space is just absolutely incredible thank you and yeah. well it's a it's a wrap for today's episode of mangtas nation we hope you enjoy the conversation and learn something new today don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It helps others discover our show. We promise to be back next time with another great episode. And once again, this is Jackie DeMank. And Wouter Del Barre. Stay tuned for the next episode of Mangtas Nation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. Follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com.